Christmas 1945 was the first Christmas after the Second World War. For displaced people or DPs, millions of them in camps throughout Europe, it was the first Christmas that they could spend in relative peace and security for many years. According to Catherine Hume, a relief worker in a large Polish camp, it was like six Christmases rolled into one. The Red Cross had sent out hundreds of thousands of parcels full of dried milk and spam and cigarettes and chocolate. The DPs themselves were stealing pigs and brewing their own schnapps. By early December 1945, plenty of DPs were in hospital because they had severe facial burns on account of having peered into their homemade stills too early. There were no proper shops, no proper currency, so black marketeers made a fortune selling hairpins and makeup and stockings and British Army whiskey. The defeat of the Nazis meant that people could have a proper Christmas at last. But the defeat of the Nazis did not mean that everyone could go home. Years after the Nazi defeat, people were still in DP camps, those from Poland, from the Baltic states, from Ukraine, from Yugoslavia, all felt that they could not go home because the Soviet Union was so clearly dominating the land east of the Iron Curtain. DPs remained in camps, many of them in western zones of Germany. Their reluctant hosts, the Germans, just wanted them to go away. By Christmas 1946, the DP world was a fairly miserable place. Young, active, intelligent and healthy DPs had found other homes for themselves, many in North America or in Australia. This left a hard core of DPs increasingly vulnerable, increasingly isolated, increasingly uncertain about their futures still in the camps. Why don't they go home, asked the Germans, forgetting that many of them had been shipped into the Third Reich as slave labour in the first place. It was in this wretched atmosphere in the Christmas of 1946 that the Quakers decided they would revive what they saw as the true spirit of Christmas, a spirit based on unity. The Quakers had been working with refugees and displaced people in Europe since the summer of 1945 and had grown increasingly concerned about nationalism in the post-war world. Everyone was agreed that the excessive nationalism of the 1930s had led to the Second World War, but nationalism was alive and well after the war, particularly in the DP camps, which were all organised according to national groups. So in 1946... The Quakers organised their first multi-denominational, multilingual nativity play in Goslar, a market town in British-occupied Germany. British armed forces, local Germans and DPs from as far afield as the Ukraine and Poland and the Baltic states all joined forces to produce a nativity play so as to celebrate Christmas together. This was not without problems. Some of the Orthodox Christians were at first reluctant to celebrate Christmas early, along with the non-Orthodox. Mary had to be played by a relief worker because there was so much intense rivalry for the key role amongst the different national groups. Yet DPs were, of course, ideal people to play any role in a nativity play in a Christmas story. Like Mary and Joseph, they felt homeless and lost and isolated. But how do you organise a multilingual play? How can it be done in such a way that everyone understands each other? The Quakers were quite clear. They would not privilege any languages, they would not privilege any groups. Each player would say their own words in turn, in their own language, one after the other. Here is the road to Bethlehem, said the first child in German. Here is the road to Bethlehem, said the second child in Polish. Here is the road to Bethlehem, said another child in Lithuanian and so on and so forth. Okay, so what was it like for the audience? Unwatchable, maybe. Confusing, certainly. Nevertheless, for those who were taking part, it was at least an indication that it was possible to have some kind of international cooperation, despite the increasingly chauvinistic and nationalistic atmosphere. <laughs>